Let us open our eyes to the light that comes from God and our ears to the voice from heaven. Seeking his workmen in a multitude of people, the Lord calls out to him, Is there anyone here who yearns for life and desires to see good days? The urgent call to awake, to listen, to take action, was first addressed to the 6th century monks of Monte Cassino, the monastery established by St. Benedict in the hills of central Italy. The phrases are taken from his rule, which in 73 short chapters sets out the aims and practice of monastic life as St. Benedict presented it. Within a century of St. Benedict's death, in 543, his rule for beginners had become the most influential rule in the West. Every movement of reform and renewal has come back to it as to their source. Our own community is the product of two such monastic reforms. In the 17th century, Madame Florence de Vecchignol desiring to observe the rule in all its integrity, founded the reformed monastery of Pay Notre Dame at Douai in 1604. Foundations followed, and another Pay Notre Dame grew up at Liège, Belgium, in 1627. It was this house which founded our monastery dedicated to the peace of the heart of Jesus, Pax Cordis Jesu, at Ventnor in the south of the Isle of Wight in 1882. In 1922 it transferred to its present site in Ryde. As the church was dedicated already to Saint Cecilia, the third century martyr, the community is known as St. Cecilia's Abbey. In the second place, we are heirs to the tradition of Salem. Don Prosper Garanger revived Benedictine life in France when he founded his monastery of Saint-Pierre of Salem in 1833. Our community became part of the Salem congregation in 1950. For both Dom Garanger and Madame de Vecchignol, the return to the Benedictine tradition could only be accomplished by the adoption and observance of the rule of St. Benedict. It is by the rule of St. Benedict, wrote Dom Garanger, that we will be Benedictines. Fifteen centuries after it was written, the rule has lost nothing of its freshness and immediacy. The message of mine is for you. Is there anyone here who yearns for life and seeks good days? Each of us hears the call in different ways, and the nuns of St. Cecilia's come from many countries and several continents, a striking witness to the mysterious power of God's call transcending nations, obstacles and distance. But there is one thing we all share in common, our desire to seek and serve God in the monastery. This search for God takes place within the enclosure of the monastery. Our monastery stands in 22 acres on a rise of land overlooking the sea. The beauty of our surroundings nourishes and sustains our search for God. The buildings are grouped around the cloisters which link choir, refectory, infirmary, library, chapter, and communal rooms. The most important building is the church, 
one side of which forms the nun's choir, where we chant the divine office. Here too, Mass, the central action of the liturgy, is said each day by a monk of Cor Abbey. The pattern of the day is established by the Opus Dei, the work of God. Nothing says St. Benedict is to be preferred to it. In the Divine Office there are seven traditional sections or hours, varying in length from ten minutes to an hour or more. All consist essentially of psalms, a short reading and a hymn, concluding with the Lord's Prayer and the Collect. The office is so arranged that the entire day and all our activity are made holy by these recurring times of worship and praise. In addition to the seven day hours, there is the night office or vigils. The longest of all the hours, it is characterized by a greater number of psalms and by readings from scripture and works of the fathers and church writers. A reading from St. Thomas Aquinas. God alone satisfies and infinitely surpasses man's desire, which for that reason is never at rest save in God. In the words of St. Augustine, you have made us, O Lord, for yourself, and our heart is restless until it rests in you. It is in the name of the entire Church, and for and on behalf of the whole world, that we offer this sacrifice of praise through Christ the High Priest, ever present in his Church at prayer. The form of the office is not arbitrary. It is the prayer of the Church offered to God under conditions which she herself determines. In living fidelity to a tradition hallowed by centuries of Christian worship, the office at St. Cecilia's is sung in Latin in Gregorian chant. There is also individual prayer which is inspired and nourished by the divine office. Through our contemplative life of prayer in the heart of the Church, we endeavour to draw down God's blessings on the world and thus cooperate, as far as in us lies, with the redemptive work of Christ. Our apostolate is a totally hidden one, but, as one of our former abbesses used to say, it has the advantage of reaching the ends of the world there is no boundary to prayer. The life of the monastery is a rhythmic succession of three elements, prayer, work and study. All three are a way to God. Saint Benedict wished his monks to work to avoid idleness, but also to establish a balanced life in which the body as well as the mind and spirit, are given to God. Our Lord gave himself to manual labour for the greater part of his life, and it has always formed an essential part of monastic tradition. As Saint Benedict says, then they are truly monks when they live by the labour of their hands. All the members of the community share in work, and in God's sight, no single monastic work is more important than any other. Nothing is too great or too small for the Benedictine to undertake. So the sacristan preparing the altar, the cook preparing the food, those who serve at table, those who help the sick, are equally engaged in the work of God. Work is also a means of practicing poverty by contributing to the monastery's upkeep 
and enabling it to accomplish better the duty of almsgiving. In order to be self-supporting, as St. Benedict desired, there are several undertakings in the monastery, the altar bread department being the main one. The contemplative life is the search for God in the most simple and ordinary experience of daily living. The timetable also includes time for learning, for study and for Lectio Divina, the prayerful reading of the scriptures and the church fathers. It is the means by which we make the things of God familiar to us. Where love is found to be authentic, God is there. The love of Christ has gathered us together into one. Let us rejoice and be glad in him. The Benedictine life is a communal life in which the special vow of stability bounds us to one particular family. St. Benedict calls the monastery the house of God and our life has all the characteristics of a large family grouped around the abbess who holds the place of Christ. For St. Benedict, the abbot's primary qualifications are goodness of life and wisdom in teaching. It is the abbess who transmits the teaching of Christ, of the rule, of our monastic traditions, by word and by deed, and she encourages each one to grow in her monastic life and in faith. The nuns honour their mother as Christ himself, whom she represents, and express their love for him in their filial confidence and affection for her. Grouped around the abbess, the nuns practice towards one another a pure and humble love. The foundation of this love is that daily, ordinary practice of fraternal charity which the rule underlines. The novitiate, which may consist of juniors, those in first vows, novices and postulants, is like a little family within the family, but it looks outwards, ready to welcome new members to the school of the Lord's service. St. Cecilia's extended its family in 1967 when it established the first Benedictine foundation for Indian nuns near Bangalore. Shantinileam, House of Peace, has drawn many vocations. When a girl enters St. Cecilia's, she spends some time as a postulant, generally about nine months. After that, she receives the Benedictine habit and starts her two-year novitiate. She can now fulfil special duties in the Divine Office. In the novitiate, she has extra time to study such subjects as monastic life and tradition, doctrine, scripture and the liturgy, a study which she will continue to deepen throughout her religious life. St. Benedict defines in a few words the signs of a genuine vocation. The concern must be whether the novice truly seeks God and shows eagerness for the work of God and for obedience. The time passes quickly and soon the novice is making her first profession when she takes the three Benedictine vows. The first is stability, which is a lasting commitment to one monastic family. The second, conversion of life, which includes poverty and chastity. By it, the novice binds herself to live out the whole monastic life according to the rule. It is a commitment to a lifelong process of being transformed as she follows Christ. The third vow is obedience, the free, humble, loving surrender to the will of God. The whole meaning of our vocation is summed up in these three vows. 
First vows are taken for three years, after which the junior may look forward to solemn or perpetual profession, when she consecrates her whole life to God in the monastery. A simple verse of the 118th Psalm expresses her complete self-offering to God. So she me domine, secundum eloquium tuum, et vivam, et non confundas. And her appeal for his acceptance and grace. Receive me, O Lord, as you have promised, and I shall live. Do not disappoint me in my hope. She has now been blessed by the Church to say its official prayer, the Divine Office, every day. Yet profession is not an end, but a beginning, and the monastic life has been described as one long beginning. As we grow in our monastic life, we become more and more deeply drawn into the liturgical cycle, into the timeless mystery of Christ. The riches and beauty of the liturgy, our simple life of silence, solitude and humble labour, stimulate our search for God and satisfy it. Coming to the monastery to seek God, we find instead that he is seeking us.